Welcome to episode 203 of Tim Talk, the podcast about the DC animated universe co-created by Bruce Tim. I'm Chris Lord. And I'm Cameron Dexter. And uh, I'm awake. You're awake. Um, <laughs> we're awake. We're awake. And we're not apes. <laughs> and we're not apes. In a, what, what I would call a rather unprecedented situation here, this is our normal record time early on a Sunday morning, uh, Cameron literally had to wake me up t- <laughs> to get this podcast going. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so whatever reason, my body apparently needed almost 11 hours uh, uh, of sleep. We, we suspect it might be the really, really shitty movie we watched last night. Yes. Um, Do we want to talk about it now or are we going to save it for plugs? <laughs> oh, I guess we, we will save it for plugs, I suppose. I, th- I think this might be more of an anti-plug. Oh, it is. the, the, mo- the This movie was so bad, just to give a, a, like, a, a bar. Mm-hmm. This movie is so bad. My level of what a bad movie is has gone down. It's like every movie I thought is a bad movie is now an okay movie. So wait, oh my god, this is actually, this is not good, because you had a, you had a pretty high, like, you, yeah. you love movies that are really, really bad, What it now which takes means to, all those bad movies have gone up in yes. your estimation? Yes, what it takes oh no. to now be a one out of five is, you have to put in so much work to be one out of five now. <laughs> Everything that was there before is now automatically two out of five. Actually, I gotta look and see if, if on my, um, my... My film tracking app here. Can I can I rate something zero stars? Is is that possible? Because if so, it no, I can't. Okay. I I it, it's down to that that minimum of one star. Which if if I recall, the other movies that have such rating are like the theatrical cut of Justice League and the second Fantastic Beast film. But like that's the thing is like in comparison, those movies aren't that bad anymore. Ooh ooh wait I I'm, okay so here's. If I may, real okay. quick, it's a tangent. Other other movies that have a one star rating. Uh, 1998's The Avengers, so the one based off of the British TV show. Yes, I have not of, seen that. That that is particularly bad. As I mentioned, Justice League, Fantastic Beasts two, uh, this horror film called The Void that I saw years ago. That's just bizarre. Um, the recent Mulan I have as a one star film. Ooh, that's yeah. Uh, I have X Men Origins Wolverine as a okay. one star film. I. That's an interesting spot because I've rewatched that movie in the yeah. past couple of years, and it's one of those where it's so bad it's fun to watch now. Oh, see, I I, I did like a whole rewatch of pretty much all the X Men stuff recently, and so this is a recent review. This would okay. have been like the last six months, and then Mission Impossible Two also has a one star. Oh, I still have not watched two rating. I I, I generally how I do this is like, if I like something, it's three. If I don't like it, but it's like fine, it's two. And if I like actively hated it, it's one. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to be fair, these, this is all, this is all kind of fair. These are terrible films. Yeah. To your point, the movie that we have not yet mentioned that we will, we will declare, (laughs) keep everyone waiting in bat plugs is worse than all of these. Oh my gosh. Yes. By a substantial margin. But yeah, this, the, the rating can go no lower, but yeah, I think, um, the movie was so bad. It literally fried my brain. And uh, forced me to sleep in so goddamn late. Yeah. Your brain had to rewire itself to understand, like, how any of this got approved by anyone in Hollywood. Oh, my God. It there was... are some a li- there are two A-list actors in this movie. Yeah, it, it was it was particularly painful. Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll get to that in plugs. But in the meantime, in the meantime, now that I have two great episodes to watch, I'm, I'm up and oh, great. I thought they were great. Ooh, great might be a little bit generous, I think. I think they're fine, <laughs> all things considered. Um, but yeah, we do have a couple of Just League episodes to get into. So let's, shall we just go ahead and, and, and jump on in here? Let's jump into it. Okay. Uh, I'm totally not going to make up this synopsis as we go. No, nah, you did, got it. I, I luckily watched these yesterday and didn't have time to do anything else this morning. So we first up have uh, Flash and Substance, our, our first real Flash-focused episode, I'd say, in the entire universe so far where it's like he's it's really his episode it's all about him yeah yeah because the only other one i would i would put as a contender is the mr miracle episode but again that is just flash it's just the main character but it's not his story right exactly yeah so um in this one the flash museum is about to be opened in central city Mm -hmm. and a bunch of the flash's rogues who are mad at always losing out to him in particular mirror master captain cold captain boomerang and the trickster 
decide they're all going to take a shot at stopping him before the museum opens to try and uh, embarrass and frustrate him and get back at him for all the times that he's stopped and captured them. Um, and it almost happens, but luckily Batman, in a rare moment of being a good guy, agrees to attend the dedication of the ceremony and brings along with him Orion, and they're able to join with the Flash to stop uh, his rogues from killing him slash doing bad things yes. but unfortunately not from wrecking the museum which mostly gets destroyed <laughs> yeah that's fine though <laughs> okay um so i i thought this was fine you thought it was great i loved this episode i mean we have talked about this a lot specifically the moment where flash sits down with the trickster at the bar and we really see his like compassion for him in particular um what about this made you feel that it was great? So we've seen, we, we've had two full series that focus on Batman and Superman, respectively. And those are pretty much the only two characters we've seen interact with their town, their right. city being a character in itself. Gotham, yeah. is a, Gotham is his own character. Metropolis is his own character. This is the time we kind of get to see Central City be its own thing. Uh, and with that... Batman has this aura of fear around Gotham. That's what he's best known for. All he knows how to do. Exactly. Clearly in this episode, Superman is above the people. When he is su- when he's Clark, he's part of the people. When he's Superman, he's above the people. Mm-hmm. When we see Flash with the Central City civilians, he is a hero who is part of the people. And that's okay. a trait we've never seen before, really. Okay. Uh, it's so fun to see how he interacts with just the other people. Everyone knows him. You know, he's like, this is the closest we've had to like a friendly neighborhood character. I, this is like the, the opening sequence of homecoming where he's going around and just kind of like saying hi to all the people in the neighborhood. He knows all their names. He knows what's going on in their lives. Yeah. And even to the point where like, as the episode continues, uh, the, like he knows the villains are all there. He mm-hmm. knows the villain bar. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, you know, they go, they unwind there. I'm not going to ruin their fun. Uh, and even when they get there, you know, the scene that we've been talking about for five years now mm-hmm. of uh, Batman wants to go Batman on the villains. And Flash has to, you know, like, no, that's not how we do it here. This is yeah. my city. We're going to do it my way. Yeah. And the way we're going to do it is, you know, he's going to finish his drink and then we're going to talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, th- there is something interesting going on here where. I think, doesn't Orion even point out, like, you kind of play the fool a little bit? Yeah, the the last line from Orion is talking about, like, he's not a comedian because he's dumb or because he doesn't care. He's a comedian because, you know, it's easier to fake a smile when everything's bad. Yeah. And, you know, someone has to be smiling. Uh, you play the fool to hide the warrior's pain. Oh, okay, yeah. It's it's an interesting idea. Um, and actually, I there, there was... A similar line in um, a comic that I'll, I'll I'll plug it plugs at the end there, a Spider-Man comic, where his villain kind of points out the same thing. It's like I I respect that you're able to make light of such serious work. Is kind of the idea, and I think there's something similar to what the Flash does. Is that yeah he he does take this stuff seriously, but never never overly seriously or like it never feels like a burden to him it all it all does feel like a joy he's genuinely loves to do what he does he loves helping people he loves that I mean, he does get quite of attention out of this as well um but he really is having fun yeah and through all of it and i think another big comparison we can make is when you smile at the end of a job the job doesn't seem as hard and especially yeah. the people around you it doesn't seem like you're trying as hard yeah that's fair and so when you have these, because there's a lot of like mimicked villains between Batman and Flash. Mm-hmm. Captain Cold has Mister Freeze. Jester Trickster has Joker. Yeah. Obviously, Boomerang has Deadshot. D- yeah, <laughs> <I guess. laughs> yeah. Um, but like when you see those characters or just hear their names in Gotham, they instill so much fear immediately. Mm-hmm. Mainly because when you see Batman deal with them, he, you know, you see him struggle you see him having to you know fight and when he's in this like kind of state when he needs to scare them you know like they can scare the people yeah but when flash does it the names are a little goofier that does help yes but like you know they don't instill the same fear when you're like oh captain cold's coming 
Like that just sounds like a funny way to say like allergies. Right. I mean, there's even a really funny moment where the four of them, the four rogues are at that bar and mirror mass refers to them as the hardest men in town. And the woman, the waitress comes up to order and they get what well, it's, it's like a, a, an Arnold Palmer, a cherry Coke, a, a milkshake, a, milk, no, yeah, he, a, yeah. a glass of milk or something like that. But yeah, it's just like they're all, yeah, his ulcers are acting up again. His ulcers are acting up. It, you know, I, you're, 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 I mean, I wasn't cold on this episode of any stretch, and that is definitely not a, a pun intended off of Captain Cold. Like, I, I think I watched it and I, I liked it. Maybe, maybe if anything, I thought both of these were going to be great, and the, the second episode was a slight letdown for me. So maybe that just colored my whole perspective. But I, I do agree with you. This is like a really fantastic, super fun episode. And <clears throat> I think it's the first episode yet of this season that works when it's being a little more kind of light and playful I, I really haven't enjoyed most of the episodes up till now i've just found them a little bit silly and superfluous just because that last season was so particularly good yeah and this this feels like it could have been a one-off episode in season one or season two and i think season three overall has a little more levity and so it plays particularly well here but it doesn't feel dumb which i think a lot of the season so far has for me i i wonder so like because you say it could have been in season one i fully agree because i i think them teaming up would have been interesting in season one but since the 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 theme of season three is already teaming up yeah like i would have loved just a line in there of like maybe the villains bar is a little more empty than usual and it's the four villains that weren't invited to oh i see yeah. to the evil league and it's like, what if we just make our own? He's like, yeah, yeah we can stop the Flash on our own. Because they're, they're, it is kind of fun because basically every, more or less every major Flash villain makes an appearance here somewhere, either as a, an actual active character or someone in the bar or someone in the museum. So much think, like Scooby-Doo 2. Much like Scooby-Doo 2, the superior Scooby-Doo film. The fine Scooby-Doo film. Yeah. Um, so, like, the, the list I have going on here is, uh, let's see, so the, the four we already mentioned, Captain Cold, Captain Boomerang, Mirror Master, and the Trickster. I'm just seeing if there's anyone else. No, okay, looks like that's all the, the villains that have any sort of speaking roles. But we also see Abracadabra, uh, Dr. Element, and, or Dr. Alchemy and Mr. Element, who I saw a little piece of trivia that apparently, uh, in some comics continuity, that is one person with a split personality. That's great. And not all of them, but some of them. So it's kind of fun that they would be, like, there in the same space together. Mm -hmm. um, Fiddler, Pied Piper, Thinker. Sorry, what? The Top. You, the who? The Top! Ah. This is... <laughs> I, I, I'm reading this fresh, which is, I'm like, who is, who is this character? Um, uh, okay, I, I have never heard of this. <laughs> This villain, but I guess, I, I think he's part of, okay, he is included in the Legion of Doom, but he's still a, um, a Flash villain. Uh, and then Turtle Man and Weather Wizard. Yes. Are all there as well. So it was like, it's pretty much his entire rogues gallery, which is pretty fun. And like, it it is sort of fun to have almost like a catch-up episode on the Flash. To your point, we had a whole, we've had two whole series dedicated to to Bruce Wayne's Batman, mm -hmm. um, a whole series dedicated to Superman. And as we've talked about in previous episodes, random characters have these sort of pseudo embargoes on them, including Batman, Aquaman, and Wonder Woman. So I think the the space they were open to play in was getting narrower and narrower. Yeah, and they basically kicked out Manhunter last week. That's true. Yeah, Manhunter is no longer in the series as of right now. Yeah. Um, and we've done quite a bit of GL's backstory, as we have with hot girl and some of her backstory is ongoing so they really only have so many places to pull from at this point yes <laughs> so you're right I, I i do really really enjoy this episode i think maybe it just maybe i built it up my head a little bit because mm -hmm. of that moment the tricks are but that it is worth noting that that is a really fantastic moment so you know for the context there being that they've discovered that the four villains are, are teaming up together they're trying to figure out where they're going to hit next and so they go to the bar, the Flash knows where everyone is. And, you know, Batman basically starts well, off. So the, the villains decide they're going to work together, but they don't like the Trickster's ideas. So they right. kind of boot Trickster from the from the 
group. Yeah, they just leave him behind because his ideas are absolutely insane. Like, yeah, very wily e. Coyote. Very, very much so. Yeah, you know, it just needs some barrels of oil and a chainsaw or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> just... he's gonna run into a wall. Yeah, and it's worth noting that in this, uh, Trickster is voiced by Mark Hamill, who of course obviously plays the Joker. It's fair to say, as you pointed out, his the Batman Flash comics parallel. But also, he played him in live action in the 90s series. Yes. And then played him again in live action in the... Um, 2014 Flash. Yes, in the, CW the, Flash. in the CW TV show. And then I think he continues to voice him as well in, like, Justice League action. Because mm-hmm. I, think, I think we've talked about this before, that there's an episode of Justice League action where, isn't it Trickster and Joker kidnap Mark Hamill? Yes. It is pretty much an entire episode of Mark Hamill just voicing all the characters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is fantastic. And in this version of the trickster is more of Mark Hamill's natural voice. Like, this is what he normally just kind of, like, sounds like day-to-day, slightly heightened. It's, yeah, there's a little Joker you can hear in there. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he's he's fantastic, and so he's at the bar, and Batman goes to interrogate him, and he's not really getting much. Then he tees up Orion to come in and, like, really do the damage. Which is, it's worth noting, as an aside, the really fun dynamic they established here of, you have the Flash, who's, like, one of the, if not the most lighthearted character in the entire league. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's Batman who agrees to go to the opening, which is very sweet on his part. Because at this point, Batman clearly does not care about being out in the middle of daylight. Um, and has softened up a lot before he goes real hard <laughs> by the time of the Batman Beyond continuity. Yes. Um, but that they also needed someone even more serious than Batman to come along as well. And that was Orion. Because honestly, there's probably only a handful of characters in the league who are more serious than Batman, and Orion might be the most serious. Well, I think it's so interesting comparing Orion to Flash. Because think about the lives they've grown up in. Yeah. Orion is a god mm-hmm. who has been fighting the like the force of evil, the the personification of evil his yeah. entire life. Yeah. Uh, you know, who's who's lived on uh in New Genesis. And is this, you know, you know, paradise. And then the first time, the, like, the moment that I really enjoyed is when they go to Flash's house or his apartment. Mm-hmm. And Orion's like, this is how you live? Yeah. Because, like, yeah, he's used to <laughs> having basically a whole planet to do whatever he wants. Yeah. And Flash is in, you know, a studio apartment with a treadmill. Yes. <laughs> and one of his few remaining standees. Yeah. He's still, like, the light speed bars or whatever. So, yeah, it's, it's a really fun kind of through a dynamic they've established here mm-hmm. with like these these two characters and it's just so interesting to see batman positioned as the midpoint in terms of seriousness which is such a rarity yeah yeah and then again like orion there's never been a point where he's been able to talk his way out of a situation yeah he's always had to fight or someone's always had to fight and so to, to see you know one of the seven most incredible heroes of earth you know, talk to a villain sitting down. Yeah. Like that, you know, you can't comprehend that for him. It, yeah. You like can't it, comprehend that. It's it's so outside of his worldview and his mental map and, and to your point, like his historical experience. Because, yeah, it it is a really touching moment because the trickster's at the bar and Orion's about ready to beat the shit out of him to get information, a la how he and Batman handle things. The Flash like, no, 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 slow down. He sits down at the bar and he just talks to him as a person. It's like, okay, clearly you're off your meds again. He's like, well, I you know, only I don't want to take them. It's like, hey, you know, you got to take them. They make you feel better. You're wearing the costume again. He doesn't realize that he's wearing the costume. Like, the Flash does recognize that this is a person who is struggling with mental illness, and unfortunately, there are there are consequences of that. But the Flash is going to go out of his way to at least try and help him first, rather than just criminalize him. Yeah. And, and we, we see, especially in this continuity, Batman do things like that. I mean, I think we've talked before about how this Batman also does those sort of things just in a less direct way. I mean, sometimes directly he's tried to help Harley as Batman, but as Bruce Wayne, he's made overtures I think, to I help I think that's the, that's the problem. That's the yeah. big difference is the villains don't know it's Batman helping them. Yes, They just think exactly it's just it. this billionaire who's like, yeah, I guess I'll like show some pity to this guy. Yeah. Exactly. Whereas the Flash does it in his persona. Like he's he is also trying to be a hero to the villains as well and not just the people around him. Yeah. Um, and in the same way that we've seen him have that personal direct one on one I know your name interaction with the whole city, he does that with his villains and well. And it's it's a really nice moment where he basically tells structure like, Okay, it's like, you gotta go turn yourself in. It's like, Okay, we'll do buddy. And there there's a <laughs> small moment that like I wouldn't have caught this if I wasn't in therapy. <laughs> Yeah, it's fair. Um, but it, it's a very brief thing that Flash does. And then at the start of the conversation between the two of them, the trickster asks the Flash if he wants to play darts. And the Flash oh, kind of yeah. 
doesn't really respond to that and kind of continues like, hey, you need to, you're not in the right headspace right now. Yeah. But then he re like sends the question back to Trickster as a way of like, I'm not doing what you want to do, but do you want to like, or not? It's, it's, how does he, how would you say it? it does he more or less say like, hey, I'll, like if you go, I'll come visit you and we'll play darts. Yeah. He's inviting Trickster to do something with him. Yeah. Instead of, and you know, that, that makes him feel wanted. Yeah. It, it is. It is a really, really sweet moment. And it, it is really good character highlight. And it, it's interesting, you know, beyond the, the, the dynamic of, like, the very light heart of the mid-series and the very serious. It, we, we don't necessarily see, like, a follow-through on this. But it's just it's cool to see the idea of seeing Batman and Orion watching this happen in front of them. And, like, kind of maybe shifting their worldview a little bit. And I think... I think this episode really highlights how much Batman does trust and respect the Flash, mm-hmm. which is we've talked about that in the past. That it's it's it hasn't always been the case, and I think that at this point the Flash has really proven himself. I think um, the events of Starcross really help put him along that path. But the fact that Batman just says, "Okay, what time? Yes, I'll go. I'll come support you," mm-hmm. which seems very out of character, but you kind of feel like. I think the Flash is the only one he would do that for. Now, to be fair, the Flash is the only one who's going to have his own museum yeah. open to him. But like and Superman might. Well, that, yeah, I mean, I, I, you could see that happening with Superman or like a statue being dedicated to him or something like that. But I don't think Batman would show up to that. No. Unless Wonder Woman dragged him. Yes, that's true. If she, if she he dragged, wouldn't go by himself. He wouldn't go by himself. Um, you know, even as we see in the next episode, he won't even go get burgers with him, right? Yeah. So, but something about the Flash. I think Batman recognizes that not only is Wally really, really good at what he does and that what he does is very different from what Batman does, but he respects him for, and I wouldn't go so far as to say he's jealous, but I think Batman might recognize Flash is able to do something he's not, which is, you know, the Flash's persona is not built around fear, the way Batman's is, Mm -hmm. and that maybe he's able to be a little more effective at that rehabilitation element. And I think... Batman recognizes that, appreciates it, and also recognizes that other people maybe don't appreciate yeah. it as someone who's always been a little bit cynical about him in the past. And so that's why he's willing to go to his museum opening. And I think there's an interesting parallel. You know, they're, they're very different cities, but having Central City versus Gotham, Central City is kind of the idealized version of Gotham. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> what happens when it's not a fucking mess? Yeah. And, you know, Metropolis is, is very different. You know, it's, it's kind of like a half futuristic city. But it's also a god watching over it, not a human. Yeah, exactly. It's and, you not know, just even one though man. Flash has powers, he doesn't have money. <laughs> that's, that's true. What's your superpower? I'm rich. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's also that brief shot we get of Wally, who is now has Barry's job as a forensic scientist. Yeah, showing that he's also good at like being Wally, which he, is also very fun. yeah. He he's really good at being Wally, just the way that Flash knows everyone. Wally knows everyone. It it is interesting. There's like some kind of like amalgamations of pieces in here, right? So Wally has Barry's job as a forensic scientist. Um, it's a little, and I'm, I'm sure the Watchtower database guys have done a, a deep dive on like the Flash continuity. And if I can track down the video, I'll include it in the the <laughs> notes below. Um, but like we do get little hints of other things. We see Jay Garrick's helmet. We see Kid Flash's costume. So it does kind of raise questions a little bit of. What is the broader continuity here? Like, yeah, and doesn't he even mention like an uncle in this episode? He does mention uncle who would, who would be, Barry. be who would be Barry, exactly. So there's there's some confusion there a little bit as to like what what is going on here, given that this it, this is Wally. We know definitively it's Wally, but he seems to have a lot of kind of the the Barry elements. But the the thought I had when he's at his job is he's obviously good at it, and he just reminds his boss like, hey, I asked that half day off. He's like, oh yeah, you got it. Which then makes you think, is he always asking for time off? Like, is is he like the best forensic scientist who's never there because mm-hmm. he has to do all this other shit all the time? Like, ev- like every time we've seen the Flash in Justice League, he's on some sort of mission, half of which takes him like to the other side of the galaxy, and we presume lasts for days. Right. So does he just take lots of time off? How does that work? having a full-time nine to five while also doing this i mean we he you know he moves at super speed we don't know how long it takes him to actually do 
his work. Right. It could be one of the situations where, you know, it's it's the ideal corporate job where you get your work done in five minutes and you just kind of sit there for six hours. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's done. Here you go. But he's the only one who has, like, an actual clock in nine to five job. Because obviously Bruce can do whatever the fuck he wants. Right. All the time. And he does. I mean, Clark... Car can like go out on uh, like on like right. recording jobs. He, he's employed, but yeah. he's a reporter. So you know, I don't think people expect him to like show up at the office at nine a.m. and leave at you know five six p.m. I think the idea is that he can kind of come and go as he pleases. Mm-hmm. Um, I just for me, it's it's such a weird idea that this entire time, like whenever they you know get back from you know Oa. The flash like okay this has been great gotta go mm-hmm. <laughs> has to race in and go to work <laughs> shit, 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 shit. i'll be there i'll be there i'll be there i mean that's like a whole thing with barry is like he's famously late to things all the time right even though he can run at super speed but i yeah. guess that that piece kind of brought is brought in here as well so i mean it's it's a funny idea that he has this this nine to five job um i also love to the um the reporter who's uh like absolutely in love with him and apparently that character is Linda Park, who in the comics is married to Wally West. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. She's also known as Linda Park West, which is kind of fun to just see her like uh, totally crushing on fangirling over Wally and his just absolute obliviousness. She literally hands him her number on a piece of paper and he just signs it and hands it back to her. Yeah. <laughs> which there's an added layer of humor given that the Flash tends to be a little bit of a a little bit of a corn dog, which is a, of a nice way of saying he can be a little, little. And he's a womanizer. A little bit of a, well, like an unsuccessful one at that. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, he actually does have someone who really likes him. And he doesn't even notice because he's just so caught up in being the Flash all the time. Um, But I mean, like, it's it's super fun. Like, at the very end, it's a it's a big fight inside of the, the Flash Museum. They've taken all the mirrors, but the reporter... She opens up her compacts and Mirror Master is able to jump in with with Captain Boomerang and Captain Cold. And they kind of um, lay siege to the whole place. And the Flash gets stuck inside the mirror dimension. Um, and Batman's able to get him out by doing this fantastic trick shot with a flare. Mm-hmm. Like bounces off of three different things, then falls through one of them. Deadshot would be so proud. He would be very, very proud. Um, so the Flash is able to like figure out where the spot is. And I, I love... I love that when the flare goes through and it lands on the ground and they look over and then Wally sees it and there's a little Batman emblem on the on the actual flare, oh, I miss the flare that. canister. Yeah. It just I mean, I'm sure that was put there to show like that's how he's able to make the connection, that that's Batman telling him which one to go through. But also of course there would be. I mean, but can anyone else access the mirror dimension? Like would there be any 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 other thing that could get through? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think he's the only person that utilized that, which is also kind of an interesting idea that it's this one villain has access to this incredibly powerful infinite dimension, infinite dimension and it's just this one guy has access to it. It's, I, I, I could very well be wrong. We often are. I, I'm also curious, but. like the origins of the mirror dimension, not, not just in DC, but just like in stories altogether. Cause I've seen it a couple times in American stories, but I've also yeah. seen it. I feel like it's a big horror element. Yeah. Um, I've recently seen it in uh, like one of the anime that I watched. Mm-hmm. There's a whole fight in a mirror dimension because they don't want to like cause damage to the real dimension. Right. I mean, it's the same thing in Doctor Strange. Yeah. Yeah. Is that and then um, not uh, what uh, train Infinity Train. Mm-hmm. There's a whole like the whole second season is uh, the mirror version of this girl escapes the mirror dimension and it's her trying to exist in the real world. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Sorry for the spoiler for people who haven't watched Infinity Train. Oh, I haven't either. It's really good. Yeah, I'll watch it at some point because I've heard it's really good. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of a it, an ongoing idea. I mean, I, I don't know where it came from. I'm sure there's an origin out there somewhere. I, I presume it just came from that idea of, like, looking through a mirror and seeing, like, a whole world in reverse. Like, oh, what does that look yeah, like? Yeah, that person isn't me. Yeah, which is interesting because the way this one's visualized, it's, um, it's not like the whole world is just mirrored on the other side. It's just literally a series of, of mirrors and reflections with all these like winding paths interconnecting between them. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's kind of a cool look overall, but you know, of course at the end of the day, they're able to, to stop all the bad guys and the, the museum's like mostly destroyed, but you know, the flash is like, Hey, the bad guys got stopped and no one got hurt. Sounds like a pretty damn good day to me. Yeah. It's just, and I, I will say this episode is really heartwarming. It really is. It's it's just 
it just kind of washes positivity over you at the end of the day. It's really nice. Okay, so here's a question because I see a lot of parallels between this episode and the one aspect of epilogue that we like. If this came out before epilogue, oh, the, the ace scene. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think I think we refer to that without getting into spoilers. So yeah, the ace scene and yeah, yeah. epilogue. Yeah. Uh, if if this episode came out before that, would that have made that scene less impactful? Um, because like story, you know, canonically, this does happen before the ace scene, right? And and to what we were referring to earlier, one could even infer that maybe this moment has an effect on Bruce and that's why he chooses to do what he does there. Right. It, it's a retcon, obviously, mm-hmm. since they, they aired in the opposite order. Um, I don't, I don't, that's actually a very good question. I don't know if it would diminish it from any sort of way. I, th- I think it would change the, the meaning of it a little bit. Maybe. It might feel like they're just rehashing something else that's been done before. I wouldn't see it as that. I would see it as Batman learning from the Flash. Well, right. And I think, yes, it would add that. And I think we can add that as a retcon, but in yeah. terms of like, would it have had less impact on me if we saw it in the other way around? Maybe just because it's, that was the first time we really have seen any of the heroes try to do that to really like sit down one-on-one with their, with their villains. And the fact that it's Batman who's doing it is really substantial because notoriously he just beats up people with mental illness all the time. Yep. So maybe, maybe it wouldn't have had quite the, the impact um, but I, I, it is a fun idea to think that Bruce's perspective maybe shifts a little bit because of his time with Wally, mm-hmm. which still becomes interesting. Cause I, I feel like we don't ever really get an answer as to why Bruce becomes as just awful and jaded as he does by the time it gets to Batman beyond. I mean, there's inferences to be pulled. And again, I don't know the timeline. I know, I know the, the watchtower database has figured this out, but, you know, theoretically, it may be the events of the flashback events of Return of the Joker occur after this. Mm-hmm. And that might be a lot of what pushes Bruce into a darker place. Um, you know, plus we he gets, makes reference to, like, Selena. We assume that maybe something else happened with her down the line. That's why she's, like, gone, gone from his life entirely. Um, but, yeah, it is interesting because this is – at this point in Justice League, this is the closest Batman is to, say, the 1960s Batman. Oh yeah, very much so. And I don't, I don't mean that in like in terms of him being campy, but if you will, how Adam West always referred to himself as the Bright Knight, like a version of Batman that was more optimistic and sincere and heartfelt. Um, Just walking around in the daytime. Yeah, walking around in the daytime and and trying to do the right thing for everyone all the time, including his villains. Um, I think this is the closest we've ever gotten is this point in the Justice League in the DCAU continuity. And, and, and to be fair, it does, it does make sense. Um, but yeah, that's a good idea. I don't know. What, do you think it would have changed your perspective on it if it had been the other way around? I, I think a little bit. I think if it was the other way around, we would have brought that, brought this scene up of like, this is where Batman learned to be compassionate. That makes sense. Yeah. We would have brought it up during that episode. Um, so out of, out of curiosity, I had to look up and see, not knowing this character before, who is the top? <laughs> Oh, yes, please. <laughs> in comics. Well, I'm going to guess, if I can guess, uh, he is a spinning top. <laughs> um, okay, his abilities are increase intelligence, mental powers, use of use of gimmicks, gimmick tops. Yep. <laughs> Ability to spin at incredible speeds and endures vertigo and others. Oh, my. That is um, <clears throat> quite, quite a lot. Uh, his name is Roscoe Dillon. Uh, he's a, a weird name, a, a small time crook who turns his childhood obsession with tops into a criminal persona. <laughs> I'm not surprised by any of that. <laughs> Look, OK, wait, when was OK? He was created in 1961. I was going to get I was so I was going to guess 60s. I think <laughs> I think it's fair to say the, the 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 modern connotations of the word were not on the minds of the writers necessarily no. when, when they wrote this though there is kind of a long a long running history of like um like gay creatives just subtle subtly throwing in things that the hetero community does not recognize yes <laughs> um uh oh i guess he does appear in justly the flashpoint paradox which is which is cool 
Um, oh, he's in the Flash. Oh, but it's it's a female version of the character. Okay, which makes it maybe slightly less hilarious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just can't. I just can't get over this. This is maybe my my absolutely new favorite thing in comics. Is um. <clears throat> Here you have someone else to dress up as for your next convention. <laughs> who are you on the top? <laughs> no, but who are you dressed as? I have to do this now. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> if only we had recorded this episode a few weeks ago, I could have made this work in time for LA Comic Con, which could've. is literally ongoing as we're recording this. Um, but okay. Uh, you heard it here, folks. I'm making a promise that uh, at, at some upcoming convention in the convention in the next few years, I will go to a convention dressed as the top. There you go. <laughs> I shouldn't find this as funny as I do. But no, I you, you got you got to find that you got to find the little joys. <laughs> I'm not gonna take it from you. <laughs> oh, oh my God! Oh, that was fantastic. Um. Any... Oh, the outfit is it, that's a lot of outfit. That that is that is a lot. It absolutely is. Um, uh, you know, and and maybe fittingly, it would leave very little to the imagination. So yeah, if, for people who don't want to Google it, it is uh striped bright yellow and bright green. Yeah, horizontal stripes. Yes, it feels very like rugby uniform. It does. Yeah, like, uh, like European football. Yeah, and then he has kind of like it's almost like the superman crest but without the the angled pieces on the the top of it as you will it's just sort of like flat so it looks like a spinning top but oh my god yeah that is um just a just a goddamn delight oh yeah look at that pose Ooh, hello <laughs> yeah they know what they were doing they, 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 they fully knew what they were doing <laughs> Uh, yes. Do you have anything else for this episode? I don't. I, I can. I, it can get no better than this. How about you? Uh, I, I liked how Flash refers to his villains as Manure Master and Captain Koala. Oh, that's that's good. That was it. That was my my last note. <laughs> uh, all right. So then, moving on to our next episode, uh, Dead Reckoning. So this primarily follows uh, the ghost hero. Dead man. Boston Brand. Boston Brand. Uh, who our is, Boston boy. Our Boston boy, who's now out at uh, Nanda Parbat, and he's basically wondering why he hasn't yet passed on, because he was able to solve his own murder with the help of Batman about a year ago. And uh, the master of a collection of monks at Nanda Parbat tells him, your, your goal was not to solve your own murder, it was to solve mine. And at that point... Bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. And at that point, uh, Tala, who's been rescued from Amir, apropos of our Amir Master conversation, mm -hmm. uh, by Gorilla Grodd, opens up a portal to Nanda Parbat and brings along with her a, a whole army of folks from the Legion of Doom. So what we got, uh, Lex Luthor Rampage, who I guess is, is that also Mongao? I guess. Yeah, they refer to her as Rampage. She looks like Mongao. Yeah, but she's not yellow. Well, but she's got she's, she's the same. It's the same color scheme as um, Mongol. Well, man, so remember in the Suicide Squad, there was a female Mongol. Mm -hmm. I think that's Mongao, right? Y yeah, but in in the comics, Mongao exists, and she's she's the same color as Mongol. Right. I thought that's who that's this character was. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's Rampage. They call her Rampage. They call her Rampage. Maybe it's also Mongal. I, I don't know. I'm not going to bother to look it up right now. Um, she didn't seem strong enough to be Mongal. Because I feel like Mongal would be on a similar level to Bizarro. Um, okay, I guess in Rampage... Yeah, she's a she's a person who's just like imbued with powers because she's exposed to some radiation or something like that. Yeah. So I mean, she, she looks like, you know, DC's She-Hulk. Yeah, but basically. Yeah. yeah. Essentially, so... Um, so it's, the uh, like I said, Lex, Tala, Rampage, Atomic Skull, Devil Ray, and Bizarro, plus a whole army of Devil Ray soldiers show up and they're there to steal, like, uh, it's very ambiguously how it's worded, but it's basically like the, the heart of the temple or something like that. It's like this orb that seems to contain like all of like, sort of like the psychic energy of the, the, 
the space, but it's like the heart of Nanda Parbat. Mm-hmm. Um, they steal that because the evil plan that Grodd has been alluding to so far this season, and we're, yes. we're about halfway in at this point now, is he has had Lex build some sort of like amplifier device. So they go to Gorilla City yep. of, of Grodd's home city, mm-hmm. um, Gorilla City in Africa, and basically, they put the heart of Nanda Parbat, plus inside this machine, they put Grodd's telepathic helmet from the Brave and the Bold on top of that, and they put it inside the um, like force field illusion projector that covers the city. It's basically the same technology that uh, um, Wakanda has in the MCU, of like it casts a shadow so it looks like nothing's there, mm-hmm. plus it's a little force field. And they're using that as an amplifier to rewrite the dna of all humans well so what he told lex was this was going to uh be a mind control device to control the entire world right but instead he's gonna turn the entire planet into apes yes this episode went from like a three to a six immediately six out of five i i love that you you went up for you Went very much down for me at oh, that point. Oh, man. Because I, I remembered there was an episode where they turned to apes. And I couldn't remember when it yeah. happened. And it wasn't until uh, 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 Grodd is like, oh, but that wasn't actually my plan. That it clicked with me. I'm like, oh, my God, it's this it's, episode. It's, it's this. And it's, it's just like. It's so good. And I, uh, I, I too remember, like, there's an ape episode. But I couldn't remember, like you, I couldn't remember what it was. And I... I really like Dead Man as a character, mm-hmm. um, and I think actually my first exposure to him would have been um, like the the Gotham Adventure comic that tells that story of Batman helping solve his murder. Okay. I had that like actual single issue comic way back in the day. I'm sure I have it still somewhere stashed away in a box. Um, but I think that was pretty much my first intro to him. And then you know obviously he appears in various places. Like he he appears fleetingly in Kingdom Come, one of my all time favorite comics. And mm-hmm. I knew he appeared here and some other places. But I like him a lot as a character. He's just interesting. Like this. This haunting spirit that's left on Earth who can go and inhabit other people's bodies to try and right wrongs and solve murders or whatever. You know, so in this one, he's primarily living in Superman's body. And he recruits Batman and Wonder Woman to help him stop all the villains who attack Nanda Parbat, which, of course, leads him to, to Gorilla City. But, like, I love him as a character, and I love that idea, and I love this sort of super high spectacle not a full-on murder mystery, but there's an element to it a little bit. And then it just dips into, we're going to turn everyone into apes. And to be fair, it's, what, two minutes? Yes. Maybe max. But even that two they all, minutes. They all get to punch something as an ape. And then yes. they're like, okay, we've, we've burned our budget. Right. Now we got to turn them back. And look, and there's some funny little things in there. Like, when <laughs> when Lex turns into an ape, he still has no hair. Yes, I, that was incredible. <laughs> no matter what, Lex must always be bald. <laughs> Which... It's funny, but it just it just kind of ruined it a little bit for me. And we don't we don't actually see that effect happen across the rest of the world, right? No, it it's just the kind of the three people in the room and then the the three heroes yeah. outside. Well, and if we're going to get real pedantic, which we must here. I th- I think it's interesting because I'm not sure the exact wording he used, but he basically said like every man, woman, and child's going to become get their DNA written to become an ape. So we're like, well, is it only humans. Presumably not, because Superman also turns into an ape. It's true. The big question that I have that this episode does not explore is we know that at this point, Martian Manhunter is hiding as a human on Earth somewhere. Mm-hmm. So for the five minutes when every human being on the planet, presumably up in the Watchtower as well, maybe not. We don't know. It's not cl- that's not addressed. Right. But I mean there's some people that are in like the the Hall of Justice area. Exactly, Metro Tower. Mm-hmm. So, my question is, was there a moment when everyone turned into an ape except for John Jones, who's just standing there going like, "Oh shit. What has happened?" No, I think probably what happened was he turned into an ape for a second, but you know, he turned himself back into a human cuz he can just shapeshift again. Well, right. But then he saw everyone else was still an ape and had to like Turn back and turn an back. Ape. Yeah, because he's, he's trying to be <laughs> yeah. undercover. He's going incognito. So, <laughs> did he do it? I don't know. But it's it's so stupid. Because I thought the question you were going to ask was, is it all species? Oh, okay. Are there a bunch of fish that just drowned because they turned into apes and lost their gills for a second? I I think 
you know, because they love to like have their their designations on these things. Like it's all humans, but it also usually includes Superman. So it's like, oh, or it's all mammals yeah, or something like that. It's all humanoids. Yeah, I, I'm assuming he didn't turn apes into apes. Maybe he did. I yeah, don't know. They wouldn't know. They wouldn't know. So I think maybe it was meant to just affect humans. I mean, this is dumb comic book logic where, like, you can do these sort of things and somehow it's specified enough to know who it's affecting and who it's not. Yeah. Asinine. Um, but, like, I was really on board with this episode kind of up till that point. And then I was just like, mm, I loved it. I, I loved I it. This. And then I hate this. The, the shot right after that kind of brought it back down for me. Uh, where we see... Uh, Oh, and Devil when, Ray kill Devil Ray is the one that that does the final shot that quote unquote quit kills the the master. Yeah, and so Boston Brand is kind of on this vengeance run. Whenever he sees Devil Ray, you know he he takes over Wonder Woman's body, and what that shot showed me was like you see how much Wonder Woman and Superman are holding back. Yeah, because when Boston Brand takes over, one punch cracks his helmet. He's a uh, Devil Ray's helmet. He's like wh- he's injured. You hear him injured. Yeah. Uh, and then he's like, no, no, no. Like, this isn't how the master would want me to get his revenge. Yeah. But then the last shot, he, man, Devil Ray comes back. And he's about to shoot Wonder Woman, takes over Batman's body, and grabs a gun on the ground, or a laser on the ground, shoots Manta Ray, Devil Ray. It's, into- <laughs> it, yeah. He, yeah, he takes over, Dead Man takes over Batman's body because Dead Man sees Devil Ray and everyone else misses it. Batman leaps onto the ground, picks up Lex Luthor's fallen That's gun. That's who it was, yes. Shoots Devil Ray, who then falls into an open circuit panel and yes. gets electrocuted. To death. To death. Yes. Confirmed death. Confirmed dead. And then, like, Dead Man is horrified because he accidentally killed somebody. And then also Batman is angry because he inadvertently killed someone with a gun. Yeah. Worst thing that Batman could ever possibly do. And so then Dead Man is basically punished to stay on earth because the the scales have been tipped mm-hmm. um according to uh ramakushna who's this kind of uh, the the deity the deity of, of nanda parbat yeah exactly yeah who, who is not a a god of order or a god of chaos just okay another god i'm glad you know these things because i sure shit don't um yeah i mean it, it see it's interesting because like you and i have a very much opposite track there because like i love this episode until it does the ape thing and then i I hate it, and I love it when it has that moment just because it is such a big deal, especially for Batman. Like, it's it's something that – that's a pain that he's going to have to live with even though it wasn't him. But especially for a guy who's so obsessed with control, the idea that, like, he lost control of his body and he killed someone with a gun would weigh on him a lot. And we don't necessarily see the fallout of that, but we know that there will be internal fallout for it. So actually, I love that moment, even if it's a if it's a heavy moment. I think the only reason I don't like it is because we don't see that repercussion ever come back. Yeah. Except for except for Boston being stuck on Earth longer. Maybe now we know why he becomes such a hard ass. <laughs> why he becomes so miserable. This, yeah, this, this was the turning point. I mean, it it is interesting. Like these episodes, generally speaking, are a lot lighter. Like we were just talking about. But also, sorry to 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 jump back. Don't we see in Batman Beyond while we, like the start of him turning? turning kind of grizzled is he realizes he's too old to be Batman and he pulls a gun on someone. It's what makes him retire. Yeah. yeah. It's that he's, he's too old. He starts to have like, um, like a, a heart attack or striker has like heart failure mm-hmm. in the middle of a rescue. And the only way he can save himself is to have to pull a gun on one of the goons and he doesn't actually shoot him, but he realizes like he can't do this anymore. He, yeah. he, he is so compromised to having to have a pull a gun and that's what makes him retire. So yeah, I mean, and this might be like, you know, uh, an allusion to that to some degree, but yeah, it's part of what makes him a dick. But like these episodes, generally speaking, this season has been a lot lighter. That being said, this episode has an insane body count. Oh yeah. Like they, they do subtract some deaths because everyone in Nana Parbat do- is resurrected. Well, yes, but okay. So except for the guy at the very beginning, who was like the bodyguard of Nana well, Parbat. Exactly. So we, we kind of jumped around a little bit here, but like jump back to the beginning. So out at Nana Parbat, the Legion shows up and there's um, a guy blocking the entrance. He looks just like the villain from the Mulan animated series. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Just like it's, him. It's not, it's, it's not Shere Khan, but it, it's another S-K. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you to look that up because yeah. you'll, you'll be frustrated by not knowing the I, answer. Yeah, I'm going to look it up. 
Um, but he's blocking the interest and entrance and they just kill him. Like his devil ray shoots him full of tridents. And I think, I think what you can, the differentiator here is between someone dying and not dying in this continuity is, do we see the actual Sean thing? Yu. Sean, you, thank you. Mm-hmm. We see the thing where they would die. Like the fact that we just see devil ray shoot the tridents and then we don't see the body to me, tells me he died because they couldn't show him die on screen. Right. So they kill him. They go into the temple and they have to face all of these monks who are, you know, trained martial artists and have some sort of extra spiritual energy. I don't really know that much about Nanda Parbat. I mean, Bruce talks about how he, you know, the master was one of the people who trained him in, in martial arts. And yes. there's kind of a long running history. I don't remember all of it. And again, I j- literally just woke up, so I didn't look it up. What is the, because I always get this one confused with the Marvel ones. Where does Doctor Strange train? Oh, he trains... Shangri-La? Uh, no. no. Is that where Iron Fist trains? I don't, I don't know. It's, they're all, they're all vague because they were written by white creatives in like the 60s they're, and yeah, 70s. Yeah, they're all iterations of Shangri-La. Yeah, they're all the same thing. Which is the Journey to the West story. Exactly. I, I do, odds uh, totally blanking on me where Doctor Strange goes. Because I thought that's also Amanda Parbat. But I, when I Googled it, it it's just a DC thing. I think it's just a DC thing. Yeah. The, um, it's It's got a very similar name, though, which is the, why I'm having a hard time remembering it. Um, but they go in. So the, the Legion has to fight all these monks to get to the, the heart of Amanda Parbat. Kamartage. Uh, Kamartage. That's Doctor right. Strange. That's why it, yeah, it's kind of close. It's similarly vague. Um, and so as they're like fighting the way through, a lot of monks die. Like, specifically, I, I, I will admit, I do love this. Lex knows how to get Bizarro to do things because he knows how to talk to him in, like, the negative speak. It's like, oh, you hate me, don't you? It's like, yes. Okay, well, then go kill these people because you hate me so much. It's like, oh, right, I will do that. Um, so, but, like, at one point, he unleashes his heat vision on a bunch of monks who clearly die. Like, there is a body count prior to them extracting the heart, which then pulls, I think we'll just call it, for the lack of a better word, the souls out of all of the monks and back into this orb. Yeah. And they're presumably dead, but they're all, all those souls are returned at the end when the heart is returned, or when the heart is freed. But there are still a number of monks that died. Yes. I, you know, so... Well, I think they kind of make a point. Uh, also, the Iron Fist City was kind of long. I thank had, you. Had Again, them. yeah, it's they're all they're similar. All, yeah, very, very close to each yeah. other. Uh, because the master makes a point at the end, because he does die, bef- you know, quote unquote, die before they take the orb. Yeah. Uh, but I think everyone there is immortal. Oh, so maybe they all come back to life. Yeah, because he wouldn't, uh, you know, because his soul wasn't taken. He was That's already true. And kind came, of dead. He came back nonetheless. Yeah, and he makes a point of saying like, uh, karma doesn't, you know, karma doesn't take lives from karma taught or some something weird along those lines, which kind of insinuates that, like they won't die unless it is meant for them to die. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess that I guess that does make sense. So, um yeah, it, it, okay. So, you know, I think you're right. I think maybe actually the body count is not as bad as I thought it was. Um, but well, it, we don't know about the bodyguard out front. We don't the, know about him. We don't know about Shere Khan. Yeah. Not Shere Khan. Sean Yu. Sean Yu. <laughs> it but it it did just throw me a little bit how many bodies there were. Yeah, in this. and especially because, like I said, the tone of this has been really light. Even in my notes, you know, I I have with the the gorilla city turn everyone to apes thing. So stupid, but kind of in the tone of this season. Like this season has really been embracing what's the weirdest stuff from comics we can possibly pull and make an episode out of, and turning everyone into a gorilla is definitely one of them. At the end of the day, so it does kind of make sense, even if it's really really dumb. Um, I don't know. I, I guess for me, it's just like there was such a drastic tone shift when they did the ape thing because this episode had been a little bit darker up to this point. I just feel like this episode has so much. Like, yeah. it's a Boston brand story and then it's an ape story. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, it's Boston brand and like he's kind of the A plot. Well, and I, and I guess it's not really the B plot necessarily because it's Gorilla Grodd. So he's the villainous plot. Mm-hmm. But like, there is so much happening in this episode like yeah they go from Nanda Parbat to Gorilla City and it's like this whole 
big crazy thing and we got Ramakrishna in there. There's a lot of new lore yeah. and new characters they incorporate all into here. Um I Okay. It's it's a funny joke. Mm-hmm. The Gorilla Grodd's ultimate goal is to turn everyone into apes. Yes. I can't cut that. I will refuse to cut that. Do you think, though, making that choice undercuts him as a credible villain? What I think he could have... Do you think it's in line with the character to have him do that? No. Okay. What I think he should have done instead was say, like, he should have been the one building the mind control device... And have some line of like, I can't, like the human mind is too much, like on a mass scale, the human mind is too much for me to control the entire world. Mm -hmm. But eight minds are simpler. And so, so like he had to turn them into apes because that was the only way he can control them. That makes sense. Yeah. Because then Lex can still be like, I could have done it. Because I think if, if like Grodd wasn't telling him stuff because like it was almost a superiority thing, what Lex has been saying the whole time. And let me like, I could have done the human one, but you just wouldn't let me in on the plan ever. Yeah. Then there's more reason for like, yeah, you're dumb. You don't know what you're doing. I'm, th- I can do this. Like, I agree with you. I think that would have made it make a little bit more sense. It, it It's an amusing reveal, but yeah, I, I think it, it just feels a little bit ridiculous. And for, for someone who's supposed to be a genius who like, you know, it, Lex and Grodd could spend their entire lifetime having a pissing contest to see who the two of them is smarter. But also we could believe that either one of them is supposed to be like the smartest person on the planet. Yeah. But then, you know, ultra humanite is like over in the corner playing chess. That's true. With himself yeah. There, six there's, times over. There, there's, there's a lot like, of, I'll let you guys remember who is actually the smartest one here. Yeah. There's a lot of like really smart people, but it, it just felt a little bit dumb. But of course Lex is just furious. Like this was your grand plan all along. <laughs> monkeys and so he i mean he he, they're back they're apes lex yeah apes yes they're back at the the legion of doom headquarters and lex says you know i was planning this a long time ago but this is stupid he just pulls out a gun and and shoots grod and we do get an andrea moan out of him so he's not dead right um but he's like i'm taking over does anyone have a problem with that and no one does (laughs) yes i'm sure they were all like quite upset when they just randomly turned into apes well, because what they don't talk about is everyone's clothes rip. Think of the think of the dry cleaning pill everyone now has oh because, God, of, because of Grodd. Do you, I mean those I, those outfits are skin tight? Mostly. I would hope hope that Grodd has included like costume services as part of his twenty five percent. But knowing him, I doubt he does. I'm no. sure. I'm sure he's trying to save costs everywhere he possibly can. Uh, I mean, he probably has a dry cleaning service inside the evil lair, but it costs. Right. Yes. It, it's one of those quarter machines. Exactly. You still have to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it was kind of, it, not only was the idea dumb, but the fact that as soon as they destroy the generator, like it just negates the effect. Like it, that thing was just going to have to run forever in order for the effect to stay was kind of stupid. Like it just, you know, it, it felt like a really contrived point they had to just force into there that I didn't really like, care for. So I have a few questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Um, Grodd can use his teleporter to get inside gorilla city yes the league cannot yes that is weird i I'm question ga- mark i'm gonna assume i'm gonna assume that grod has a greater understanding of how that system works considering that he used to live there and for all i know maybe he helped i don't think this is ever established maybe he helped build it because that, that he's, so, he's so crazy smart so i i can understand where he would have insider knowledge that the other the league wouldn't turns out to break into the thing Okay, I will accept that. Yes. Uh, question two. Yes. <laughs> Should this have been a two-part episode? Fuck you, Cameron. <laughs> Absolutely I not. I want to see them be gorillas longer. I don't. I <laughs> I think it's really, really dumb. I, look, I, I, I brought it up earlier. I'm curious how the rest of the world, the rest of the league, and exactly. in particular Martian Manhunter react to this, but all I need is like, Asides. I just need like a moment of everyone be like, what? So if you remember the pilot episode of the Powerpuff Girls. I've never seen the pilot episode. Oh, of it's good. I've never really watched the Powerpuff Girls. Craig McCracken I, is, he's very good at writing stories. Right. I mean, I know everyone loves it. It was just like, it was a, it was a little after my time. Just that, this, that, this that tiniest is, yeah. little bit after my time. Uh, well, the pilot episode is Mojo Jojo turns everyone into dogs. 
It's fantastic. Uh, Honestly, but, the world would be a better place. Yes. Yeah. It's very cute. Um, but it happens in the first five minutes of the episode. So the episode is them as dogs the whole time. Okay. And it's so cute. And it's them, like, having to... Because they kind of lose their powers as dogs. Yeah. Uh, and so it's them just having to kind of outwit the the smart monkey uh, as puppies. <laughs> and it's very cute. See, that does sound very cute. That sounds very in line. Yeah. And you see the with... whole city turned into dogs. Yeah. That's like, a... You see them driving. The yeah. mayor still has his mustache as a dog. I think I've seen that picture. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that makes sense in that universe, in that world and tone. Yes. It just feels a little stupid here. Uh Okay, question three. Uh-huh. I knew your answer to question two. Yeah, obviously. Um, would you rather have seen the other Boston Brand episode? Would you rather have seen him needing Bruce's help to clear his name? I mean, it, it was a good comic. And it's a great, because um, that's the episode we get in Brave and the Bold, which is where I was introduced to Dead Man. Yeah. Uh, when Green Arrow and Batman help Brand figure out his murder. Yeah. It, it was a fun comic, and it's all set in a circus. And I, I I don't remember if it was the same circus as... I don't remember if it was Haley's. I can't remember if it was the same circus as Dick Grayson. I think it might have been. I, I think it is. I remember I called Nightwing was involved in all of it. Um, but, you know, it, like, it was... It, I remember I really liked it as a comic. I, you know, I don't know the history in terms of where the the story genesis of those comics came from i know i know hillary j bader wrote a lot of them mm-hmm. I, I can't remember if she wrote that one or not so i don't know if maybe that was a pitched idea that ultimately they decided to just do as a comic instead of as an episode i would have liked to have seen that in the new batman adventures era maybe less so than seeing it here now because especially at this point we we don't have access to the rest of the batman family um I mean, yeah, I suppose I would have. I like Boston Brand a lot. I think Dead Man's an interesting character. He's got a great look. Mm-hmm. It's a really cool look, cool power set. So I would have liked an episode that had him that also didn't involve eight people. Yes, I, I agree with that. I think that should be its own episode. Yeah. The eight people episode. And then maybe we don't have to have this one. <laughs> Which, I, like, I mean, it. I mostly like it because I, I like Dead Man. I'm like, you know, I, I, I get it. It's fine. But. Yeah. Yeah, and, like... To fit it in line with the humor and lightheartedness of season three so far. Yeah. Um, the way they do it in Brave and the Bold, the gimmick is no one believes each other when they're possessed by Boston Brand. Right. And I think that's fine. And it's, you know, it's undercut super quick. The second Superman's taken over, Batman immediately knows, like, oh, it's Boston. Hey. Yeah. Uh, and like that that's such a fun gimmick to roll with, where it's Speedy talking to Green Arrow and... You know, Ollie being like, why do you now have a Boston accent? Yeah, right. I I did I did love um George Newburn's like semi Boston accent that he was doing there. It, it it was kind of fun. Yeah. And I also do love when he he first takes over Superman up at the watchtower. Um, because they had just been fixing something and, and Superman's basically trying to convince Batman and Wonder Woman to both go get milkshakes with him. Go get pie. Well, pie well, yeah, it's like okay. Yeah. It's like uh, the, the quote is, come on, Bruce. I know a burger place, Metropolis, that has the best fries in the East Coast. And the milkshakes are so thick oh, it wasn't that, he, that he gets taken over. And at that point, Dead Man says, I need your help. And Wonder Woman's <laughs> comment is, that's pretty thick. <laughs> <laughs> just like uh, Sus- Susan Eisenberg continuing to be amazing and just fa- so fantastic with like the dry lines mm-hmm. thrown in there. But like that got a very, very genuine <laughs> chuckle out of me well then i enjoyed that when <laughs> they get to gorilla city and dead man finally leaves superman's body he finishes the sentence yeah and it's like you need a spoon why are we in africa why are we in africa <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i mean i do kind of love that the, these especially those three have been doing this for so long that the, it just doesn't really slow them down when oh this my sort god of shit happens i that was one thing i wanted to bring up was how once they're fighting once they're in gorilla city you know there's a handful of villains in there yeah but they are so in sync with each other. They're so in routine yeah. that they plow through everything. Right. Without, like, nothing gets in their way. Nothing right. can stop this trio. They, and there are some pretty big hitters amongst the, the team that they take out there. Um, and the, it only really starts to slow down when Bizarro comes in the fight. Because obviously Bizarro can go toe-to-toe with Superman. Mm-hmm. But even then, yeah, it's like the three of them are so good together that... It almost it does kind of highlight indirectly. You almost only need those three. 
Yeah. Like you can send those three into almost any situation and they can handle it perfectly. Yeah. And, and because they do like they, they have such distinct skill sets, right? It's like Batman is the tactician and he doesn't have the, the power that Superman and Wonder Woman do, but like he can think through the plan so meticulously and orchestrate and the trust is so built in there between them. They almost don't even need to communicate. Mm-hmm. And the fact that, Superman and Wonder Woman are kind of on par in terms of just how freaking powerful they are. But Wonder Woman also has the sensibility of a warrior. Yes. You know, and Superman doesn't. It, it, it's, it's, it's awesome. And the, the animation is great. Like the fight sequence in Gorilla City in particular is so, so good. It's just so fluid. And they really kind of hold on to shots for a long time just to, to really emphasize the almost like balletic nature of the fight yeah and also just how fast they are yeah it's great i mean like there's enough in here that makes me actually overall really quite enjoy this episode despite the ape thing yeah i know (laughs) but that that one piece is is one of the reasons why i liked it so much for what it was because it's a great fight Mm -hmm. um and now lex luther is in charge of legion of doom yeah mutiny mutiny always (laughs) love a good mutiny yeah so he threw a coup and it worked um, so now we'll just have to wait and see what Lex is going to be up to going forward. What his, yeah. what his plan is going to be. Does it involve Brainiac? Probably. Maybe. <laughs> uh, but yeah, overall, some fun stuff in here. Yes. Some decent stuff. They're, so. they're making my short list. <sighs> oh, God, that'll be an interesting <laughs> conversation. We get to it. Um, all right. Anything else to, uh, to talk about here? Or do you want to uh, move on? I think we covered it all. All right, so why don't we do our, our plugs and then wrap things out here. Cameron, what do you have to plug this week? Do we do we want to start with the movie? Oh, fuck. Okay, wait. We can be quick about it. Yeah, okay, let's do it. But we did it. tease it up. We got we to we fulfill the tease. We have to pay off the setup. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. So we watched 1986's Babes in Toyland, <sighs> starring Drew Barrymore and Keanu Reeves, which is a musical... <laughs> Sort of. Technically. Technically, <laughs> if not necessarily. Yes. Uh, about a girl who dies, question mark, uh, but doesn't. Okay. Here, I, I, I got this. I got <laughs> it's this. It's Wizard of Oz. Yeah, I got this. Yeah. So, it. this is, I think, the third version. There's also, like, one from the 30s. Yeah, 1934, like 34, 1961. 61. That's the one that everyone knows. That's the Disney one. Okay. Babes in Toyland. So... The idea here is that it's all set in Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Because they have a whole fucking song about Two Cincinnati. Two songs about it. Well, they have one song that re- and recurs. Prize. Yeah. Yes. About Cincinnati. And the idea is that uh, Drew Barrymore reports this little girl who apparently has had to grow up too fast, even though the movie cut all of the references of why she had to grow up too fast. Yes. So she goes to see her sister at the toy store she works at on Christmas Eve, and a massive snowstorm is coming in. And her the older sister's boss is this really really like blatantly creepy lecherous dude who's like constantly hitting on this 16 year old girl yes and the older sister basically quits because she's tired of this guy being such a prick so they're getting a ride home from her not actual boyfriend but like the guy she has a crush on keanu reeves played by keanu reeves who looks i mean keanu reeves always looks great but like 1986 keanu reeves like hello i should probably double check to make sure he's 18 i was, at the I time. was just about to double check that too uh, but very i mean like like peak teen heartthrob handsome Keanu Reeves and then their other friend George Georgie whatever the other guy the yeah. other guy and so like the four of them are driving back in the snowstorm and then they're driving back in Keanu Reeves yeah he's like, 22 you're good I'm good in his his crappy Suzuki which he incorrectly refers to as a Jeep <laughs> you're going into so many <laughs> unnecessary details here no no this is all important <laughs> so much unnecessary this is all important as they're driving along in the snowstorm somehow like they hit a bump and <laughs> <laughs> and and it, Drew Barrymore, who is sitting in the, I think supposed to be in the back seat, falls out of the back of the no 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 no, no Suzuki no. on a sled. There is so yeah, it looks like it's the row seats where it's yeah. three, you know what a normal car looks like. But what we learn is there is no middle seat in this not Jeep. Yeah, but she's actually sitting on her sled. She's sitting that she on, got for that she didn't want for Christmas. Yeah, she's sitting on the sled that somehow fits in the back of this suzuki which it would not fit yeah it's a big sled and so she like she slides out of the car down a hill and presumably hits her head on a tree and then it's transported into toyland, toyland. and this is where it becomes very wizard of oz but instead of all the characters <laughs> in wizard of oz it's just like all of like the folk tales you hear as a kid that i assume are like in the public domain yes. it's like 
Humpty Dumpty and Little Miss Muffet and the woman in the shoe. And Jack and Jill. Jack and or, Jill. Sorry, not Jack and Jill. Uh, Hansel and Gretel. Hansel and Gretel. Jack Be Quick. All of this sort of shit. Well, but here's the, you you see them and they reference them once. Once. Yeah, once. And then the only characters you see are horrible, uh, like, animal suit, like, bad mascots for, for sports teams. Yeah. Including a lion that is literally wearing a football jersey. Right. They, they all look like something out of the, the really shitty island of Dr. Moreau. Like, there's a similar level of production quality happening here. Yes. And... The the whole story is basically like they have to stop the and it's you know classy Wizard of Oz all the characters in real life reprise different roles with the exact same names in in Toyland and they're trying to stop like the the guy who owned the toy store in the real world he's like trying to take over Keanu Reeves cookie company and he has yes. the, he's trying to marry his girl well, it's his uncle his uncle it's Keanu Reeves, his uncle is in a marriage to Keanu Reeves his girlfriend the older sister right like a forced marriage that they, yes they Mary stop. Barry or whatever that's no, not Mary Mary Contrary Mary Contrary thank you look it, uh, who is being set up because their mom <laughs> couldn't afford the rent on their shoe house yes so she was setting up the marriage so she could take the uncle's money yes all, all of this is to say like we said up top, this is one of the worst movies and not the worst movie I've ever seen in my entire life. We we were watching it specifically because we're going to go to a recording of How Did This Get Made, where they're going to cover this movie. We did not yes. watch this for uh, like unprompted of our own accord. Yes, and, and nor do we ever wish anyone to watch this. No. Uh, no. Under it, any means. This is not a plug. This is a warning. Yes. <laughs> do not watch this movie. It is not... Like it's not even worth it for like the 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 bad movie entertainment factor. It's just flat out bad. I think we just needed more alcohol. That's true. We we were pretty much sober when we watched. I was it. not. <laughs> you were not. I was. We we watched this and it was just like it was so awful. It felt like it lasted four hours. Yeah. So the version that's on Amazon is ninety minutes. Yes. And when we Googled it. This movie was originally two and a half hours. Yes. It's, I, I can't. So they cut a full hour out of the movie right. we watched. And they, they probably should have kept some of the things that point out the plot. No. In favor of maybe cutting out some of the. the they could have cut more, honestly. The, 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 the 10 minute long little go-kart chase. <laughs> that makes no sense. I, it, the, it, uh, I'm at a loss for words as to how it bad this is. It changed us. It, it put me into an 11 hour coma. Yeah. The camera had to wake me from this morning. <laughs> so it's awful. Don't watch this. Do not watch this. Um, even if you are like a, a diehard How Did This Get Made fan and are going to go listen to that episode, I don't like watch the trailer. Honestly, you could watch the trailer and you'll get enough yeah. from that alone. You'll get the key pieces. You don't need to know. And then, more than yeah, that. just read the read the plot synopsis on Wikipedia. Which is what we should have done because the plot yeah. synopsis actually revealed a lot more than we did. <laughs> So. I am now very curious what the 1961 is. If it's you the go same enjoy story. yourself, yeah, because there's also an animated 97 version. That's true too. That looks maybe in the same studio that did Do All Dogs Go to Heaven because it looks kind of in the same style. Oh, um, uh, it doesn't matter. It looks yeah. bad. That guy. Yeah, sure. Um, it's awful. Don't go watch it. I agree. But what are your actual plugs? Uh, I have two actual week. plugs. Uh, I it, it's been a minute since we since we've seen each other, so I, I've been. Speeding through everything that came out in theaters recently. This is true, yeah. Uh, so I watched King Richard. Oh, how was that? my family. I really enjoyed it. My mm -hmm. parents weren't as keen on it. It's definitely an Oscar bait movie, like through and through. Well, 100%. And Will will get a nomination for this. Yeah. He's incredible. I bet he is. Uh, the movie, how do I phrase this? There's, <laughs> there's no conflict, which is also kind of fine. Cause I, I hate it, that. It's a movie where like, like there is drama, but in the end, everything everything kind of works out for them every time. Well, yeah, it's it's a story of Venus and Serena Williams. We know how successful they become. Yeah, it focuses much more on Serena. Okay. And this may be dumb of me, but I told this to someone else, and they also had the same realization. I didn't know they're not twins. Oh, I didn't know that either. Right? They always like they're like two years apart. Yeah. Serena being the older one, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think Venus is the younger one. I think. Okay. It, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, the the, the story is about the dad, obviously. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's I I really like the movie. It's really okay. good. It's it's a, just like a nice warm sports movie. Okay. Where everything just works out every time. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I didn't really have any interest in seeing it. Mm-hmm. I, 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 a, like, biopic with a really incredible lead performance is not enough to make me want to go see something. Mm-hmm. That's so, fair. Yeah. Uh, I would say if it's, I don't think it'll get nominated for Best Picture, but I think you should probably only go watch it if it's nominated for Best Picture. Okay, even though I'm from Yeah. Um, then my other plug is I've seen it twice now because it's so good and it's so lovely. I watched Encanto, mm-hmm. uh, which is the new Disney movie. I've heard lovely things. It's and, so and beautiful. Let me clarify. I have heard lovely things for people that aren't Cameron. This is true. Who loves all things Disney. Yes. The Disney shill. That you are. The shell shell. The shell shell that you are. Yes. Um, no, because shell implies that I'm getting like some, like there's a reason I'm I'm plugging them. I mean, to be fair, you do make money off of things that you make for Disney. That is true. So- <laughs> that, that is, that is. Disney does fair. pay you to some degree. Yes. <laughs> directly or indirectly. <laughs> so. Um, Encanto <laughs> is, it's so beautiful. And like when I started it the first time, the music is very different from kind of anything I've listened to. Well, it's um, it's Limit Miranda, Miranda, correct? It is, yeah. but it's not his normal style of music. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a ton of Latin influence. That's great. Uh, which is so cool, and I, I don't listen to a ton of Latin music. Mm-hmm. Uh, but kind of, I, I watched a, a, a quick video about him kind of explaining the influence of each song. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they're so different from anything I've heard before. That's cool. And I'm now like addicted to the songs. They're mm-hmm. so unique. Yeah. I, a friend of ours slash of the show, CJ, he was telling me about it this week. Um, and the way he put it, it's like, if you ever felt like you were the, um, like raised like a special kid, like you're the special one. Yeah. You will have a lot of like of emotional resonance with this. Yes. So yeah. As the only child. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have that as the only child. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, yeah, I, and the theme of the movie, the movie is just like, hey, you should probably go to therapy. Yeah, and that's literally like every character is like, oh man, my life is so hard. It's like, hey, do you just want to like go to therapy? Like, just go to therapy and talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I feel better now. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, everyone, please go see it. I feel like no one is seeing it for some reason. Yeah, I, it, <sighs> and I don't know if it's like if Luca was too close and that was, or I, if people are waiting for it to drop on Disney Plus. I, I think. This is purely off the top of my head. This is not based on any sort of like articles that I've read or anything like yeah. that. I, I think the problem we have now is that we've gotten really, really used to things being available to us at home. Mm-hmm. and Especially Disney things. Especially Disney things. And then, you know, like things are better but not great right now. Yeah. And so like there's – like even I had this little bit of like is this worth me taking one the time to go see something in theaters and also like, you know – it's it's a very minimal risk, but I suppose from certain people they might see it as a higher risk. But there's like a risk element involved, like going into a, an enclosed space for yeah an extended period of two time. and a half hours. You know, we're plus we're getting into the holidays. It's been a crazy year to begin with. Like I can understand why just like external timing outside of that movie itself has made it hard for people to want to go and like see something in a theater unless they really, really want to. Yeah. And and on top of that, like we just got bombarded over Thanksgiving weekend with movies. Yeah. And that's King there's... Richard came out, House of Gucci came out, Sing Two. Yeah. I'm not comparing it to Encanto, but they're no. both musicals. Yeah. Um and yeah, Encanto and, all came out basically in the same week. And and I, I hate to say it, but I mean uh, this this is the downside of the turn towards tight theatrical windows or limited theatrical windows and stuff going to streaming really quickly. It's like, if you wait a month, you can rent it at home. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like even over Thanksgiving, I, I watched no time to die for a third time. Cause my parents were like, Hey, we're going to rent it. Do you want to watch it? I'm like, yeah, it's like 20 bucks to rent. But I was like, fuck yeah, I'm going to watch it again. I was planning on seeing it again in theaters anyways. So why not? Yeah. And like, I think if some, unless it's something super excited, like I, I'm now maybe going to try and find time to go and see it in theaters, but this is one where I'm like, Oh, I'll, I'll catch it when I catch it. Is the thing is I don't think there's that that rush to go see something. Yeah. Um, plus maybe everyone's saving their 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 in theater movie for Spider Man. That is true. So that is coming very soon. Very soon. And I still don't have a ticket. Yeah, I know. I mean, technically, I don't either. So yeah, yeah. But <laughs> uh, yeah, those are my that. plugs. What, what have you been watching, listening, reading? Uh, yeah. So I watched a a Netflix movie that just came out on Friday called Single All the Way. You did. I did. I've been hearing very good things about it. So uh, this is where I, I have to send a shout out to my friend Eric, um, who was a friend of mine from when we worked at uh, the agency together. 
and uh, he got a, a big group of us together to sit down and watch Single All the Way, which is like Netflix's gay rom com Christmas movie. And that that's it. <laughs> that's all I need to know. I here's the thing. Yes. What? Yeah. I I feel bad when I say that I didn't really like it. No. Because. We get so little of this. Like every every little thing we get, you kind of have to like stand behind because it needs support for us to get more better things down the line. Um, like what what was the one with Kristen Stewart? I was last I was year? just about to look that up. I, I, I was, liked I that gonna, one. I also liked that one. I thought it that was, was really uh, her and Mackenzie Davis. Yeah, I thought it was really cute. Um, it was it had a lot of heart. It was like you know pretty funny at times. Dan Levy like came in and like sold us the movie. What I've come to real like I, I, I've said this a lot about. Netflix movies and, and don't get me wrong I fucking love Netflix and I think Netflix TV is is oftentimes fucking amazing Netflix movies often I've now realized what they're trying to do is they're just trying to capitalize on the like the hallmark lifetime format of just putting in very very minimal effort um, in order to put out something that they know a very specific audience will watch because they have that data as mm-hmm. to who will watch it um, it just feels like they didn't oh, happiest season was the movie. happiest season i quite like look it's cute i think it's worth a watch i just didn't think it was anything very special like i didn't find it particularly funny um jennifer coolidge is in it as like the crazy aunt and she steals the movie obviously because jennifer coolidge yes i actually thought the most of the best and funniest lines were from um there's uh two nieces in it and they have like actually the best lines in the whole thing all the way through they're super funny i don't remember their names they were unknown actors i didn't know them like it's got Kathy and Jimmy, who obviously we all love from Hocus Pocus, and Barry Boswick's in there. So like, it's like got a good supporting cast, but it's just really, really generic. And you can kind you can see things they cut as the movie is going on. Like this is not a spoiler to say, but like you know the whole concept is basically like a, a gay guy who works in marketing in L.A was dating this guy. They break up right from the home, the holidays. He brings his best friend slash roommate along with him. And of course it's like, Oh, should they be together? Shouldn't they sort of thing? And while he's there, his mom played by Kathy and Jimmy sets him up on a blind date with her trainer. Who's like the super gorgeous guy. And they're out in some little town in New Hampshire. So there's, you know, not a lot of things to choose from if you will out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but so he's on a date with this guy. And at one point, Jennifer Coolidge's character comes over and like spills a bunch of stuff on the the guy's shirt and you're like okay like we, we were making a drinking game out of like all right everyone like get ready like we're gonna have a drink we're gonna have like obvious gay baiting here and then the scene where he clearly was supposed to take his shirt off was cut and you're like and I wasn't even complaining because we didn't get a chance to see him shirtless which obviously I wanted to but it was more just like well clearly you were teeing up something here and you just let it fall it's just, it's that level of minimal effort that that's an example of just comes through of like the script wasn't fantastic. There's nothing really interesting about the performances or the directing or the editing or the design. It's just kind of fine Got it for what it is. I didn't find it particularly interesting or exciting in any sort of way. Um, you know, I didn't find the main compa- character particularly compelling. Um, but Hey, you know what? It's great because it, it was a lovely reminder that even, you know, semi-attractive very average white gay guys can find love with much hotter men so (laughs) you know what there's hope for me yet you still got a chance (laughs) there's hope so it it was it was fine it's again if you feel like you want to check it out check it out it's not an anti-plug by any means but i'll just say like i was a little bit disappointed by the 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 lack of effort in the filmmaking did you ever watch dash and lily from last year no Okay. I generally don't watch like the the churned out holiday movies. I I enjoyed that one. Who was that one again? Uh, I think they're both uh, kind of no names, unless it's um, Nate Wolf, which it may be. Um, oh, Nat Wolf. Nat Wolf. Thank you. I like Nat Wolf. Um, yeah, it's a series. It's it's. Oh, okay. Uh, then I'm yeah, definitely not gonna watch episode. it. Okay. Yeah, I also have no time for things that were clearly meant to be a movie that have been stretched out into a miniseries. Well, it's based off a book. I don't care. Yeah, it's it's a it's a book series that's written by the same people that wrote Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist. Okay. And kind of those kind of music themed things. Okay. Still. Yeah, I just it's don't, cute. I don't have time for things that have a definitive arc and should have been a movie, but they're like, well, we make more money. We'll get more eyeballs on it if we mm-hmm. make it a series. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. I like it. I'm probably gonna rewatch it. Okay, yeah. That's fair. Um, it's fine. It's fine. And then the other thing is uh for the first time in decades or possibly maybe ever, I went and bought in a comic book store trade comics. Oh. For a, for the first time. Which store did you go to? Uh 
I had to hunt one of them down when I was up in NorCal, but then in LA I went to Golden Apple Comics. On, okay, on I wasn't Melrose. sure if that was open yet. Cool store, yeah. Yeah. Cool little store. I used to work right above it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. My horrible job. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, it's it's a nice little comic store, but I went and picked up uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 79 and 80 because they are written with my colleague, uh, written by my colleague, Cody Ziegler, who's the Amazing. co-host on X-Ray Vision. Um, and so, yeah, he got to write a couple Spider-Man comics. He's got more stuff coming up, but obviously wanted to go and, um, you know, su- support him. And they're really fun. You know, like my hesitation with comics is always I'm going to jump in and not know what the hell is going on. But the great thing about like, you know, individual trade issues is up in the very front. They kind of give you a quick recap of what's happening. Um, and so at this point, it's actually Ben Riley is back as Spider-Man because Peter Parker's in a coma. Um, but it's like a, a fun story kind of, of him getting up to stand against Craven the Hunter. Ooh. is in there so it's craven who says to, to spider-man kind of the same thing that um orion says to to flash in our episodes it's like you you approach very serious work with such levity it's a good line they're obviously i'm biased but like they're really well written and like the the art is fantastic and they're they're super super fun so um yeah go check out that those comics and uh support a really fantastic dude who's a great writer as nice. well so yeah and he's got more stuff coming up and i'll, I'll continue to plug the stuff as they come out but i know he's working on um there's like a what if series where Miles Morales gets to be a bunch of different characters. Oh, that's um, cool. And he's working on one of those. So yeah, it's some good stuff. So, uh, but I'm like starting to like get back into picking up individual comics. I, I I haven't read it yet, but I also picked up the um, Superman Son of Kal El number five, where Superman, you know, Jonathan Kent Superman uh, comes out as bisexual. So I like picked up the first five issues of that. I'm gonna read that at some point and keep going with that. Nice. So, yeah, you know. Gotta go find gay shit. Got it, yeah. Gotta go support my gay shit where I can. It's out there now. <laughs> so, gotta support my friends and support gay shit. So, uh, but yeah, those are my plugs this week. Nice. So, yeah. But yeah, so that does it for us uh, this week. Uh, we are actually going to give people a heads up with our schedule instead of making it up as we go. <laughs> not a surprise. Uh, but given that we only have a few episodes left, we decided like, hey, you know what? Let's not rush it. Let's finish things out after the new year. Uh, plus, we have s- some potential guests lined up for some episodes. Mm-hmm. So we'll figure a way until after the holidays to have them come on board. So uh, next week, we're off. Yes. And then the following week, we're going to do our last bonus episode, our final year oh, in review. Man. Yeah. Uh, we basically wanted to wait a week so we could have both seen Spider-Man in time to talk about that. Yes. Uh, and then we'll be off through the holidays, and we'll come back in the new year and finish out everything. Yes. This so. is not senioritis. No. This is holidays. This is this is holidays slash strategy. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so taking a little bit of time off here around the holidays. But uh, yeah, you'll, you'll get one more year in review from us where I will have seen like less than 10 theatrical release movies. <laughs> and so I will have a lot to talk about. You have a lot to talk about. So it will be interesting. Um, but until then, you can reach us at Tim Talk Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Gmail. Yes, yes, yes. You can find me at Lordifer on Twitter and Instagram. Yes, if you want to see my art, you can find that at Cameron.Dexter. If you want to see my face, you can find that at CamDexter underscore Adventures. I'm back at Disneyland every weekend. Every freaking weekend. At least for December. Yes. Gotta love that, Cameron. Love that you're keeping them going. Yep. They were really struggling this year, but thank God they've got you back. You know, I'm just trying to keep that that small company afloat. You know, small, small, you know, support small business. Support local businesses. (laughs) Hey, technically. It is local. They're kind of a local business, so it works. Uh, But thanks, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Uh, Bye bye. Oh, man, it just gets worse. (laughs) All right, I'm going to go back to bed now.